Wonderful. Hi, okay. Lexi. Welcome to Awaken in the Live. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking for like, what, 20 minutes? <laughs> And I was under the impression that we are recording. So like very good ego awakening in that moment. <laughs> I should have let you know um, beforehand, but I also didn't want to like cut your flow off because you were sharing so much of your amazing stuff. Oh my God. No, please cut my flow because <laughs> I can flow like for days, honestly. Like <laughs> it's very hard energy. to have these limits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I want to introduce all of you to Alexandra. I don't think I've ever called you Alexandra, AK Lexi. She mm -hmm. is um, a YouTuber. I actually found Lexi last year during the pandemonium when I was going through some dark night of the soul shit and I wanted to learn tarot and I found her beautiful channel, which I want to congratulate her on the air of hitting 40,000 subscribers. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, and I was just saying to Laura that now I need to actually prepare a giveaway because every time we reach a milestone, I want to give something back, you know, just to feed that beautiful law of abundance kind of energy. Yeah, and I found one of her videos a couple months ago that you did last year and you were sharing yeah. the different tarot decks that you um, acquired during your journey. And it was a mix of like, storytelling the hero's journey it was like traveling it was like odysseus right and like all the <laughs> lovers you encountered and the heartbreaks and like it was like magic and i was like who is this person i need to like get to know her <laughs> this weirdo <laughs> well i'm a weirdo then because i was like um and just remind me of the degree that you got too, because you also went into academia. Yes, so I, um, yeah, I finished my PhD at the University of Edinburgh mm -hmm. and my PhD is in sociology, but um, my MSc and my bachelor's degree are actually in child and adolescent psychotherapy. So like mm -hmm. art therapy, play therapy, and I just decided like midway through my studies, as I was getting my PhD funding for a psychology PhD, I just uh, switched um, perspectives. I decided that psychology is about controlling the human mind and spirit. And I decided I don't want to be part of that controlling group. Mm -hmm. So I chose sociology also because I think there was a shift that happened inside of me where I was less self-focused and I became more socially conscious and then it was natural. It was a natural process for me to actually switch to a sociology degree. And I was also hanging out with people in the sociology department who tended to be much more cooler, more relaxed, more open-minded, not so judgmental and um, kind of like focused on their own healing and wounding like the psychotherapy crew was. Um, but I think both of these parts are inside of me. I don't think I am less of a psychologist than I am a sociologist. I think it's just part of the natural progression. And I remember at the time, I was mortified of making this transition from psychology to sociology because nobody did it. No, no one around me was like, how should I take my funding from one department and place it into the other department? What will the people that were funding me say? What will other people around me, like my family and friends and I was just like let's do it you know let's just do it and <laughs> I took a leap into the unknown one of the at the time I did not know but it was one of the many leaps into the unknown that eventually carried me to this point where I end up loving who I am and I end up really enjoying my life but it was a process that gave me a lot of stomach aches I'm not going to lie <laughs> it's not at all an easy endeavor to just fling yourself into the unknown and to say like well let's just see what happens <laughs> mm -hmm. um it's it's a bit crazy I'm not gonna lie I sometimes question my sanity <laughs> but my connection with the divine and the fact that people keep coming up and telling me yeah. that wow you know this really helped me or what you wrote or the channel that you have the videos that you put out the work that you did for me it's really helping me heal you know and 
I seem to have this talent. I mean, I'm really sorry that I made you cry, but I get this from everyone. <laughs> I remember once I was at a random party for New Year's Eve and I was just pulling out tarot cards because people asked me. And all of a sudden they all started crying as I was pulling the cards and telling them what I saw in the cards about their family and their deep wounding and what I noticed in the cards. I was just looking at the cards, not even looking at them that much, you know, they just started crying. And my sister was with me at the time and she's like, great, you spoiled the party. You just made everyone cry. <laughs> and I was like, I, that's not my intention. It's just, I get into the zone. I see the cards, I start talking and then this healing happens for a lot of people around me, which I think, astrologically speaking, and knowing my chart, as I was talking to you earlier about this, is my, uh, is the effect of the Pluto and Scorpio in the first house, you know, very strong initial reactions, making people heal on the spot through um, the very powerful aura that I have. And it's been a process learning to accept this power because I was really uncomfortable with it. And in the past, it used to bring a lot of wounding towards me before I ended up understanding, hey, I can actually harness this power. I can become aware of it. I can sit with it and I can use it to heal other people rather than pull in all sorts of difficult traumatic experiences towards me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, feel free to, you know. <laughs> no, I don't think it's, be I don't apologize for making people cry. First of all, <laughs> there's a catharsis there. It's so healing when somebody can hear you and see you without having to explain to them what you've been through and mm -hmm. we discussed that Lexi has a Sag moon and your Sag moon makes me have some kind of epiphany awakening and you're you know because I have Uranus in Sag yeah. and we have it in the same degree so when you shared your story it was more because Sagittarius is about getting to the truth and yeah. and it, it, there was a truth in your story that was reflected back to me um, because, you know, like attracts like, and I think um, <laughs> your story resonated with me because I question what I'm doing all the time. I'm like, did I just leave my six figure job to <laughs> have no home? <laughs> you know, like, and, and your family being like, yeah. are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? And for their generation, it's all about security and foundation. But for us, I think you were sharing before we started it's about exploring beyond what is available to us in this lifetime and so i just want to segue back into your personal story and your origin story mm -hmm. because you are from romania which i have a student from romania and he tells me it's super witchy there i've never been yes um, <laughs> and you speak like five languages right <laughs> i'm like who is this person i, I live in america people don't speak more than one language. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful thing because it shows the the wonderful power that you guys have, right? It's it's a privilege. Well, in my case, I was groomed from early age to not be myself, basically. I remember my parents teaching me English ever since I was young because English was the language of color television right after the fall of communism this was a big thing you know english was the language of mcdonald's menus mm -hmm. and uh computer right computers were coming up and my dad works in it so he was always on the computer always obsessed with programming computer games things like that you know so my parents were actually quite forward thinking and from a young age they kind of taught me how to speak in a different language i remember i had an alter ego in my second grade at school i was Sandra, <laughs> the English au pair. So it's already kind of grooming young children into becoming, you know, like uh, <laughs> a, a subservient economy. Um, but that was the thing. It's kind of like becoming aware of this process, right? So on one hand, I'm really happy that I learned these skills and that I'm able to speak Spanish and Italian and French, which to be honest, if you're Romanian, it's quite easy to speak those languages because they're part of the Latin group. So uh, we have words in common. It's not that big of a hassle to understand these languages. Um, so you already have like three in the bag, right? And English is everywhere and it was everywhere when I was growing up, so that one too. But to be honest, I actually, the one I'm most proud of is German <laughs> mm -hmm. because that's also connected to my romantic history as well. 
I mean, I left my country when I was 20 years old to pursue love, basically. I fell in love with this German student that I met while I was paradoxically in Austria, doing a completely random um, NGO supported project um, in a very small town near Vienna called Murzuschlag. And um, that was kind of like the beginning of my freedom and awakening, because the thing that really motivated me throughout my life um, has been love. <laughs> Nothing else motivated me other than love. It's like my, my colleagues wanted money or they wanted success. But for me, like uh, becoming successful or becoming somebody that has a uh, a body of work attached to their name is something that was an acquired taste that I became aware of after my divorce. So after I got this first very big disappointment in love, but like love has been my guiding source. And I was able to do anything for it. Anyway, so yeah, I, um, I left my home country. I was not very, how should I say, I grew up in a very traditional environment with my parents but I never felt very close to my mother or like my home roots. And when I started traveling, and that, I think that's the paradox of Sagittarius energy, right? Um, it's about going on this hero's journey and traveling and having lots of adventures and seeing how other people live and how other people talk and having all these random spiritual or sometimes even kind of low vibrational experiences and then you're finding out that actually where what you are seeking is the place where you came from yeah. it's kind of like you want a different perspective on the place that you came from because that's basically my story I traveled the world throughout my 20s I had a variety of different experiences, a variety of different jobs, and I'm very blessed for having had these experiences and having been protected throughout them. But then I came back home because I feel that this is the place where I can root into. But my home here is a very different home than the one I had left because I changed so much and I see it in a very different light. And I'm able to accept it and love it because I had my ego being shaped as well through all of these experiences that I had. So I think it's a really beautiful story. I'm, I'm still in the process of settling my roots. Saturn is in my fourth house at the moment, really drilling me to like purchase my own home and kind of establish here a social network. And I'm still kind of building this up right now, but I'm, yeah, I, it feels like a homecoming of some kind, like a spiritual homecoming, to be honest. Yeah. Well, Saturn is in Aquarius, so you actually have a home on the internet. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. That's such a beautiful way to put it because sometimes, you know, we tend to think of these connections that we establish online as superfluous. Mm -hmm. um, there's still this um, kind of belief I noticed as I was kind of dating around um, that, oh my God, we cannot tell our children that we met online and that, you know, we had a date through Tinder or something like that. And I was just thinking like, why, why, why do we tend to look down upon this work? My parents think that what I'm doing is not work, yeah. uh, but it is because you wake up, you put your energy, your time and effort, you know, you do the spiritual work, the cleansing, it is work, um, but somehow it's not yet at that level where people can actually value it like other traditional understandings. But I think this year, and that's the beauty of Saturn squared Uranus, right? We had uh, two of them and the third one is coming up on Christmas day this year. It's all about how are we liberating ourselves while trying to maintain certain traditions from the past that still give us a grounding but at the same time, how do we create progress? How do we bring in these new understandings? Mm -hmm. And it's a work in progress. So I think this is the, this, that's the beauty of it. It's not something that we can just say, wow, we came up with a solution overnight. Let's implement it. It's all going smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it would be wonderful if life would work like that. It would be amazing. But unfortunately, it's just, you know, trial and error and two steps forward, one step back and, you know. So when, you were, when you were growing up, did you ever have a vision of what you wanted to do or what you wanted to be? And even, you know, you going into a PhD, that's like a serious commitment. Yeah. And then what, at what point were you like, um, this is really not happening um, with even the acad 
academic world and then pivoting to, I guess, I mean, I don't believe that it's all fragmented. I think it's all part of the same story and what you do. All of your experiences contribute to how you show up now, but at what point did you pivot? Well, I think, as I was talking before, when I had this massive spiritual awakening, when I was in my puberty, around 15 years of age, I was obsessed with reading Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. And um, I was reading her novels. They were very difficult to understand. She had a very uh, distinct way of writing, the stream of consciousness technique. And then I stumbled upon her diaries and I fell in love with her. It's like her obsession with buying flowers her uh, admiration for other women in her life, how she was struggling to overcome depression because most of the people in her family were dying and she was haunted by their ghosts. I just thought she was amazing. And, you know, speaking of Aquarius energy, because right now, you know, she was an Aquarius son, mm -hmm. uh, born on the 25th of January, which coincidentally, coincidentally, happened to be the same birthday of my ex-husband. <laughs> he was also born on the 25th of January. And part of the reason why I married him was like, it's too, it's too fitting. I can't believe it, you know? <laughs> anyway, it's like Aquarius to me. It's like, oh, anyway. So I wanted to be a writer. I was inspired by Virginia Woolf, by her lifestyle, by the story of this woman who was struggling in Victorian England to have an identity, to come out of the shadow of her father, to deal with depression. All of these themes were very mirrored into my own experience. Um, I was also struggling with depression. It was never diagnosed, but I, I tended to go through my low periods. I also think it's part of the process of being an introvert in a predominantly extroverted world. It's hard to accept yourself in the process. Um, but I, I knew for sure that I wanted to be a writer and I was reading so much as I was in this period of being a sickly teenager, overwhelmed with all sorts of kind of negative feelings and pretty masochistic fantasies that I had back then. It was just a lot of pain that I had to process and understand about myself. And reading, looking at works of art, listening to music really inspired me. And I think I made a decision with myself back then, I just want to have an adventurous life. And in order to be a good writer, I understood from that small you know, perspective that I had back then, that young perspective that I had, that you have to have a lot of experiences and it's really important to open up. So even though I was born in this traditional background with, you know, people kind of telling me you should marry quite young and obey the man and, you know, don't think of yourself as being the best of the best. You don't really matter that much because you're a woman, you're just supposed to serve the man. I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, from a very young age, I was listening to these Greek mythological tales where Zeus was kind of kidnapping these oh, nymphs, no. you know, and I was just like, this is awful. <laughs> where is the human rights violation stamp on this guy? The you know? <laughs> yeah, are we supposed to fall in love with these images? So I was just really upset from a very young age. I was like, no, no, you know, this is not what I want. This is not what I'm going to put up with. And I kind of crafted a life based on that, the desire to be a writer, the desire to have experiences and be open to a variety of different experiences. And just the understanding that um, I don't want what's traditional. Mm -hmm. Even though there were moments throughout my 20s when falling into the traditional mindset made things so much easier for me. Mm -hmm. And that was the problem. That was the thing that always kind of made me come back at it with even renewed passion because I was like, so it's easier to be submissive. So it's easier to just erase your identity as a woman. So it's easier to not talk back. It's easier to just conform to one person and follow that person's lead. And I was like, no. <laughs> and every time I was like, no, no, no. And a lot of people, I mean, I got so much clapback, you know, I got so much, so much shit being thrown at me. I'm sorry for using this very graphic word, but people criticizing me, people telling me I'm a girly, people telling me, you know, my mother telling me I'm never going to find the man if I behave like that, you know, my father telling me I need to obey. <laughs> I just have this issue with obeying. I just, I'm, I'm not willing to just... Um, 
put my head down in front of anybody except the person I really love and admire. I can humbly serve those I love and admire, but I don't just love and admire because the patriarchy tells me to do it, you know? Um, and yeah, there were moments when I have to say I made decisions and even though they were good for me, I had to go through a period where I was like feeling ashamed. You know, that's, that's the worst part because you know you're doing something that's good for you. You know you're standing in your power and your self-respect, but you still punish yourself with your thoughts. You know, you still hear that inner critic and you still hear those voices that criticized you, even though you stood up to them, you know? And that's a process. And I would urge anyone who's listening to this to just be patient with themselves. And then, you know, once you make a decision, don't go back over it, just follow it through. Because I promise you, something so much better is coming towards you. And that's the thing that kept me going. Every time I made a decision, you know, I'd rather be completely alone than to be in a relationship where you harm me, or I'd rather do my own thing than follow what my ancestors told me, and it's harming me to do that. Something better came along, a better experience, more money, more opportunities to travel, more chances to be creative, you know, more opportunities like the one that we're having right now to grow and to learn from each other, you know? So, yeah, I guess that's my two cents. <laughs> Um, I don't I don't consider my story my story at all one of a role model, but I just hope that these leaps of faith into the unknown can inspire others to to be braver in their life. Because from my experience, bravery does reward you, to be honest. Even if it's just rewarding you by creating a space of stillness and freedom. You know, you don't have to have fantastic riches you know Alibaba's cave opening up for you or being in a relationship with Ryan Gosling which I've always hoped I would be <laughs> unfortunately you know in a different universe in a parallel reality but it can just be like living by yourself with a cat having a great reliable source of income and doing what you love you know um and keeping open to whatever else life wants to surprise you with. I think that's for the moment, that's enough for me. <laughs> I'm so humble because this is what I believe is the Aquarian energy is when you can be so like radically and have the audacity to be individual and to speak for yourself. Um, your vibration and standing in your truth helps the collective to um, have the courage to stand up for themselves. And what is more threatening to the patriarchy than a smart, intelligent, brave woman who chooses herself over and over and over and over again? Like that is why, you know, witches were hunted back and they are continue yeah. to be in modern day society. But I think that I know you're being humble, but um, I'm sure there are so many people that you reach on your channel that feel emboldened to take out a tarot deck and feel, feel emboldened to share their gifts. And I think um, what I love about your channel too is the ability to connect the dots looking back, but the ability to trust in the present moment that when you take that risk, the universe will catch you. Um, and what I loved about, and I, I will just link that video in the show notes because <laughs> every time you had a heartbreak or you chose something different you went back to your spiritual practice you picked up that tarot deck so um there's not really a question there but do you want to talk about tarot and how like did you always have this i feel like you do have oh no always, no because no. no? you're you're no, a that's the thing. pisces like you are already like tapped in <laughs> No, that's that's the big surprise. Actually, I'm late at tarot. Uh, for me, astrology was always the language of the occult. Um, as I said, you know, I picked it up loosely when I was 15 years old from really random magazines and like women had, that had crazy makeup and had like these weird telephone lines, you know, like <laughs> call Sally or Urania is going to read your fortune. Because back then, you know, in... When I was 15, it was 2001, I think. It was just like in the middle of the Pluto and Sagittarius era 
we didn't have that many resources, right? Like right now, the generations that are coming up, the Pluto and Capricorns, you know, they they have the occult at their fingertips. And there are so many talented people who are doing great work, you know. But back then, I was just like really weird magazines and <laughs> whatever you could piece together from broken newspapers, you know. Um, and I was into astrology because it was fitting this rationalistic mindset. I find that astrology is very precise. Even right now, when people ask me questions regarding timing, you know, and when, when is he going to contact me? When am I going to get pregnant? Astrology, you know, the transits, the ephemeris can, can tell you pretty specifically when something might happen. But tarot, actually, tarot was really interesting because it came to me. I wasn't, I wasn't open to it, to be honest. And it came to me um, through a friend of my ex-husband's um, who is a Gemini and Gemini is my eighth house, the house of the occult. And um, I didn't realize it when I was married, but now looking back, because, you know, I tend to have, I have a Mars in Taurus. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when I'm in love with someone, I'm like horse blinkers, you know, I'm like <laughs> just him. It's like him. Oh my God. You know? And it was also because, you know, my husband was the first person I had sex with. And it was like, I don't know, it was the whole a weird thing that I did there by marrying the first person I slept with. But then again, I did it. So there you go. Um, and then I realized that this, this friend of his, Leo, might have been low-key in love with me or like very fascinated with what I was as a human being to a level that my husband could never actually reach. Mm -hmm. That was one of the problems in our relationship that I wasn't really seen for who I really was. But this guy, Leo, um, we went to an exhibition together in Munich and we saw Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings, mm -hmm. which I absolutely love. She's a Scorpio sun and she, like really hones in on these gorgeous flowers, giving us a completely spiritual experience of the world inside a flower. And um, I, don't, I had these very beautiful conversations with him. It's like, uh, why do you love these paintings? You know, what pulls you in? And he was really picking my brains about it. And we started having these really wonderful uh, exchanges where we talked about art and paintings and the unconscious because he was fascinated with psychology as well. And I was doing my psychology, um, well, I was in between my, my bachelor and my MSc. And I was reading Freud in German in Germany, really struggling to do that because I was a little bit of a, of a hipster back then. Um, but yeah, we, we developed the spiritual connection. And at the time I was still in my, you know, when, when kind of like love comes into your life and when people kind of give from their heart and want to get to know you, sometimes when you're in this um, self-protective, rational mindset, you aren't able to actually see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got to the point where my husband was joking around that Leo's in love with you. And um, <laughs> it's just so bizarre. I was like, what? No, I'm like in love with you. <laughs> um, and he gave me this box, which was like a maze which had inside of it the first Rider Waite tarot deck that I ever received. And this was a gift that my husband actually brought to me. Um, we had a long distance kind of connection for a while and he came to visit me and he brought me this box and it's like, Leo really wanted you to have this. And it was like a maze. It's like opening the box was like following Ariadna's thread um, like Theseus did when he was fighting the Minotaur. Um, and it was like, <laughs> seeing the tarot deck there and I was a bit afraid of it to begin with and I know a lot of people that have been brought up with very traditional mindsets and kind of um, this rational mindset you know like reason above all and order above all tend to be afraid of the tarot when they first see it and I was too I was like Ooh, okay what is this so I opened the case and I thought wow this is really sweet and I put it beside <laughs> <laughs> and it stayed to the side all the way up until the moment of my divorce, which happened in the middle of my PhD, as I moved with my husband from Germany to um, Edinburgh, where I was doing my PhD. He was also working one year as a teacher um, exchange, like he was brought there at a Scottish school to teach other kids German for a year. And when his contract expired, he just bluntly told me, I'm going back home. Will you come with me? And I was like, but I have my PhD here. What do you mean? And I, um, the thing is that 
initially the agreement was I'm going to finish my master's for one year. He's going to finish his teaching assistant post for one year. Then we're going to go back to Germany and continue our lives like we used to. But I got a scholarship for a PhD after I finished my master's because there was this one beautiful person that told me, wow, you really, you're a really good researcher. And I, I wasn't, I really didn't care about that. I was just like, I want to finish my master's so I can go back home with my husband. And um, it just so happened I got this PhD scholarship. I thought this was an amazing chance to truly become the writer that I always wanted to to become, I said to myself, if I can finish writing an academic book, which is a bit more of a technical way of approaching writing, then I can write um, a novel. I can write something that can inspire people on a deeper level. And that was the whole plan. And I can't believe it, like actually just as a segue into this, I can't believe that I actually achieved this to be. <laughs> because after I, I published my book, my academic book, um, based on the research I did at my, at my PhD, I published The Storyteller, which is this erotic novel based on a twin flame connection I thought I had at the time being. But anyway, you can actually make your dreams come true. So if anybody's listening to this and wondering, can I actually do the things that I set my mind to? Yes, yes, a hundred times, yes. Um, and if I could do it, I think anyone can do it, to be honest. But yeah, um, going back to that initial moment, so I decided to stay and I decided to stick to my PhD, to my funding. And that broke my connection. It broke my marriage uh, because he started looking for love in the arms of other women. And we thought about having an open connection. We tried it and I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, well, I basically ended up kind of cutting it because it was just the best thing to do for both of us, to be honest. And it hurt me so much at the point. And I remember 2014 was a year where I mostly spent it crying. So that was the year that the German state allowed us, because in Germany, like when you declare that you want to get separated, the German state blocks you for one year. It's like you have your you have time to change your mind for one year. And in that one year, I was alone in Edinburgh for the first time on my own on a completely different territory, because back then I was with him in Germany after I left my parents' home. And it just I didn't really enjoy it that much up until the moment when I started painting. Mm -hmm. And um, so I remember like, it was, it was crazy because I was trying to pay my bills on my own for the first time. I was trying to combine the caring work I was doing for a person that had multiple sclerosis with my PhD and soothing my heartbreak. I, I was crying in, in supermarkets. I was crying <laughs> at my sociology courses. I was crying at work when nobody was watching. It was just, it was a horrible year for me, 2014, the year of the water snake. Um, but at the same time, in that summer, I decided I need to come out of this kind of dark cloud that had descended upon me. And I took a course, an introductory art course online through Coursera from, I think it was, um, Pennsylvania State University that was offering it. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this um, American Polish lady that organized it. And it was just these assignments to, to create art by going outside and by photographing the beach or by uh, drawing something on the asphalt. So I started expressing myself creatively. And I remember that I had this tarot deck, you know, like hidden somewhere. <laughs> In, in between my books and everything, you know, hidden there, peeking at me. And I took it out and I started looking at it and I started interacting with the images. And of course, I was mortified when I saw the devil and the tower <laughs> and the five of pentacles, you know, the five of swords, all of these cards that provoke these really strong reactions in people. But that was the beginning of it. So that was like the healing, the healing path, the spiritual awakening, maybe the second spiritual awakening, if not the first. And I started reading for myself. I started looking for the meanings of these um, tarot cards because one thing that Leo did was he gave me the deck, but all of the cards were in German and I had no manual. He forgot to give me the manual. So it was a lot about reading all sorts of descriptions online from websites. I remember Biddy Tarot was one of the first ones that had the complete explanations for each card upright and reversed. And 
I just started doing it, but that was 2014. And then again, I kind of put it to the side because I was like, this is not serious. My PhD is serious, you know, that's meaty work, right? Um, and then I graduated from my PhD in 2017. And um, I remember that during that lull when I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, should I apply for some sort of like research assistant position or should I go for the big, meaty, ambitious lecturer post? And again, I decided to go for something above me <laughs> and to just take a leap of faith into the unknown because everybody was telling me how, how difficult it was to reach a lecturer position while all of the women that trained me uh, my supervisors were like, no, Alexandra, it's the feminist thing to do. Do not put up with a research assistant position. Do not waste, you know, two or three years of your life like many women do, just compromising for low paid contracts for six months. You know, no, go for it like a man. Go for it. <laughs> and I did. And I got it. <laughs> and everybody was in shock. And I was in shock. I was like, I don't know what's happening. It's like my seeing my life as a film, you know. But I got it and um, I moved from Edinburgh to Oxford. And as I was moving, I got this other tarot deck, which was the Mary L Tarot. Um, and this one had a manual and it was a deck I had chosen and it was very dark. I don't know why I went for the dark one. Um, maybe because it was something there about accepting my shadow aspect as I was kind of reaching these positions of power. I didn't feel comfortable because <laughs> mm -hmm. living with so much powerlessness in my life being told I'm supposed to live under somebody's foot always being kind of like below something um, kind of made me feel really uncomfortable maintaining that position so even though I got a really good job as a lecturer in Oxford following my PhD I was never really comfortable with that position to the point where it got so difficult accepting myself that I decided to just like leave it the th other thing is that it wasn't just because it got difficult that I left it. It was also because I was noticing I was acting from this rationalistic patriarchal mindset. I was teaching the students that were coming towards me, this Pluto and Sagittarius generation that was coming up and they had these kind of weird intuitive hits mm -hmm. and like, I feel that something is wrong with society, you know, where I'm having these visions and I just thought, oh, my God, you need to see the school counselor. What is wrong with you? What is up with these kids? I had so many. I cannot tell you, Laura, how many disability um, forms I had to fill in for people that, you know, students constantly coming to me and telling me there's something wrong with me. It's like my intuition doesn't fit with this environment. So thereby, I must have a mental health issue. And then it just I reached this point where something kind of clicked inside of me. As I was training my mind as well and playing with the tarot in my free time, um, it clicked inside of me and I realized um, there is something wrong here. I'm kind of grooming these children in the name of this institution to be somebody who they're not, just like it was done to me, you know, for, for years. Other people grooming me to fit into this box, into this silo, think in this way, behave in this way, follow these rules and you will be rewarded. Well, what will you be rewarded with? A mortgage for 35 years? Um, wanting to keep up with the Joneses to a point where you forget who you are as a human being? Um, yeah, you have a good income, but what do you spend those money on? Like, it's, it's kind of like, it reached to a point where I realized that I wasn't really serving them and I wasn't really serving myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the defining moment was, which I talked about it in another podcast, was when I was reading these essays and striking out the sentences that these students were saying when they were describing like I feel that society should be this you know or I believe that and I was just I had to strike them out and say I think mm -hmm. or I argue so I was replacing believe and feel with think and argue mm -hmm. and I was like no <laughs> I, I'm not going to do this anymore I just can't do it anymore and that was the moment when I decided I need to switch for my own sake, but also for their sake, because I don't want to be this person. I, this is not the legacy I want to leave behind me. So um, I took a bold decision. I decided to put this academic environment behind me. There were other things like uh, a conflict with my boss, um, who actually is a woman that I'm very thankful to. 
But at the time being, I hated her so badly. <laughs> she was making my life so difficult, but she was an Aries. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, you know, like I, my Jupiter is in Aries. My North node is in Aries. So she's supposed to be some sort of spiritual teacher to me. Why is she making me suffer so much in this job, you know? Um, and then I realized, well, maybe it's because she's trying to tell you that you're not supposed to be doing this, you know? Maybe she's actually doing you a favor. And she did because the conflicts that I had with her ultimately escalated to such an extent that I, I didn't want to work there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I launched myself into this adventure um, and it took me a while. I wasn't completely, I wasn't completely sure of myself. I went back to academia to another academic position for a couple of months. And when that broke down as well, and I, I realized, but it broke down, how should I say, not because of other people, it broke down because I wasn't finding purpose in it. I wasn't happy with it. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was just cheating myself by being here, by doing that kind of a thing. You know, I was telling myself, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic. And I wasn't. <laughs> it's like, how should I say? It's not like I was bad at my job, but it was like, my heart was not in it. It's like I was performing a role, a mask, you know? And it was funny because I was using, um, you know, the social performance theory. Oh, sorry. I was using the social performance theory and I was arguing that, you know, people in court play these roles. <laughs> I just noticed like, hey, the universe is telling me something. It's like, mm -hmm. I was analyzing these people that were performing roles in court following Irving Goffman's theory of social performance. You know, we have a foreground self and a background self, but Alexandra, you're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I was calling myself out and that happened during Jupiter and Sagittarius when there was the transit in 2019 and the truth was smacking me in my face, you know? And I realized this is it. You have to commit to this path. It's going to be weird. I don't know what I'm launching myself in it. I don't know if there will be financial assistance. I know my parents are going to disown me, which it happened, unfortunately, but it brought me to this point where in spite of the opposition, in spite of the fear and the vast unknown in which I'm still basking, it's actually, it's actually worth it. It's making me happy. It feels like I'm contributing in a deeper level um, like I was before and like I'm being myself. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And I thought, I think that I thought that I spoke for 20 minutes straight. Oh my God. I, I can listen <laughs> to you all day long. You're such an amazing I'm sorry. color. <laughs> I was just trying to keep mental notes of, there were so many amazing things that you said, but what um i love steve jobs this quote i think it's steve jobs who says pain pushes until the vision pulls and i think um i i too went back to you know i quit the corporate world and then i tried my entrepreneurship thing and then i went back and i felt so guilty about that because i thought i'd failed but i think um looking back on it now it wasn't it's okay. Like sometimes you just have to go back to things until you figure it out. And until you really feel that, that pull from your heart, that soul's calling is louder than your fear of what your parents will say, what people around you will say. Um, and I mean, they do anyway, right? Like, yeah, people around me, my friends from home think I'm some kind of weird which which I am but like, <laughs> you know, like yes own it <laughs> but I just first of all thank you for sharing so vulnerably your story um you mentioned 2014 you cried that entire year so did I because that was the year um in December of 2013 is when I um broke up with my ex of five years and the entire 2014 um was when I cried and Venus was retrograding Capricorn in January of 2014. So we're like in that. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. And the South Node was in Taurus and oh, the North Node yes. was in Scorpio. Yeah. So it's like some weird nine year cycle being closed up right now as we're having this conversation. Um, and it's right before the nodes are changing again South Node in Scorpio, North Node in Taurus. Wow. Yes. And I remember it was. 2012, it was that whole Saturn and Scorpio debacle 
plus Neptune changing into Pisces, it was like a completely different era, honestly. Mm -hmm. But for some of us, it was like the beginning of a fresh version of ourselves, like taking down the mask and mm -hmm. whatever we built that was not actually on a solid spiritual foundation. And at the time it was really painful because you don't really understand what's happening. You know, you're like, I'm insane. Everything is going to pieces. You know, it's the end of the world. Like the Mayan said, I personally felt like it was the end of my personal world, mm -hmm. but then it's kind of like you, you come out, you come out into the light, you know, and things kind of work out in mysterious, beautiful ways. Yes they do right and they brought us to this point I mean the decisions that we made since then yeah and what we were talking about like the thread of this conversation was that we both believe there is more to life than what is available to us and that's what I love about the generation you were speaking about the ones who are uh, maturing right now is because they live without like they're all non-binary they're gender fluid they it's like science and spirituality, you know, <laughs> like challenging every single system that I feel like was really inherent in our souls, but at the time wasn't supportive of our ideals. And now, um, now it's like, that's kind of going to be the norm. And I feel going through that, you know, tense time of being being individual and saying this it, this isn't working for me um was a yeah. very lonely place because at times i felt like what is wrong with me like why don't i want to get married why don't i want to have kids why don't i just want a normal life like am i broken <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i completely can identify with that yeah but you then realize what are you measuring yourself up against it's like it's an ideal that is slowly decaying Mm -hmm. it's increasingly not the normal the new normal is this fluidity right mm -hmm. and it, it, even sociologically I was learning about it it was Zygmunt Bauman's idea of liquid love and liquid society how relationships are gradually kind of um, dissolving their boundaries in fluid neoliberal capitalism mm -hmm. so it was beautiful because on some level what I was learning about scientifically <laughs> was actually matching up to my intuition and to the spiritual work that I was getting in touch with. They are connected. I mean, I'm never going to be able to say that, you know, science is above spirituality or spirituality is above science. I don't really believe in this dichotomous view. No. It's multiple layers of complexity. It's kind of like thinking as a, it's seeing all the variety of different dimensions at the same time and being able to take it all in. Um, it's kind of complexity theory, you know, big data kind of thinking. But I really hope, I mean, it's exciting. I really, I really love the new generation when I see them on the streets, you know, like with their crazy hair colors and like how inclusive they are and um, how brave they are in certain ways because they also like to diss on each other, you know, and <laughs> they call each other out and I love that about them, but I also see how they're um, still trying to kind of conform or follow these traditional habits that are just breaking down, you know, they're breaking down on us. I mean, Christmas and what Christmas means, I think will be completely reinterpreted from this year onwards. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Saturn square Uranus that will happen to us on the 24th of December is happening exactly on Christmas day. And this whole idea of baby Jesus coming to save us, mm -hmm. while it might hurt certain people that it will change, and I'm and vehemently you know, convinced that it will change, I think it's leading us towards an understanding of, you know, in that, in that whole story, Mary counted as well, mm -hmm. Joseph counted as well as the adoptive dad, mm -hmm. the three you know, uh, people that came up, I forgot what's the name, the three wise men, magi, I think. It was. Magi. Yeah, the magi. They were basically <laughs> astrologers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm trying to think of the English translation. <laughs> um, but those people counted as well. It was the whole collective that helped. It wasn't just Father Santa Claus and baby Jesus. Yeah, let's focus on the male components of this relationship. I mean, even when I pray, for example, and this is something that I hope to be more vocal about, I've taught myself to pray to the mother and the father mm -hmm. um in my culture we have a lot of like 
traditional Christian Orthodox mm -hmm. um, kind of incantations and prayers that are all about serving the father. We have some related to the mother. And now every time when I do a spiritual session, I pray to the mother and I pray to the father. And I've even changed that whole, um, you know, like how you would say in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's also in the name of the mother and the daughter and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because why <laughs> have we completely disregarded, you know, 50% of the population, 51, if we're actually looking at the latest statistics that show that there are more women on this planet than men and women in general tend to outlive men. <laughs> it's just, it's just, I don't know, it's a whole power dynamic that was completely misconstrued by the traditions that we keep blindly following for centuries. And now I hope that we can have more conversations around how can we open up the space to include a variety of different people, you know? I was um, just having, sorry to interrupt you. I was just yeah. having this conversation with my mom this morning because uh, she is a super Christian, I believe. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but not in, the, in, not in the way where she doesn't allow um, gays to have their rights and stuff like that, but she definitely has dogmatic beliefs, which is why the South Node being in Sagittarius, like releasing that, but she ain't, she has not released any of that shit. Um, she was, she in the car ride this morning was like, Laura, I'm just so concerned about you and your soul and the things that you believe in. And I said, Ma, it's not that I don't believe in like what happened. It's just, they left out the entire story as in like women. I'm like, <laughs> it, it's like reading. Um, so this week we have American, thanksgiving right and we only oh, yeah, learned yeah. the euro colonizers viewpoint of thanksgiving we didn't know about the indigenous story it's like you yeah. there's like a african proverb if you only read the hunter story you'll never hear the lion story like mm. there's a huge chunk of the story missing and i you know, uh, I went to a Jesuit college. I took an entire course about Jesus and all of that stuff. So I said, I said, like, where are the women in this story? And the fact that Eve was created out of Adam's rib, I think that's completely a patriarchal view of like them saying that women aren't necessary, even in the birthing process. And they don't talk about Lilith. Adam's yes. Wife. I was just like, what? Anyway, we always get into these heated discussions because she literally believes every single word of what the Bible says. And I'm like, it's not that. It's just there's so much of it that's missing. Yeah, so, yeah. but it's easier. It's easier. That's why following traditional gender norms, following what the Bible tells you, following what the government tells you, it's easy. You don't have to think. You can just go into this okay, great, I'm just gonna do this. I am a, a fitting member of society. I get my rewards at the end of the day. I do not create conflict, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are rebellious, if you choose to think differently, it's almost like you're a threat to this very clean, polished, organized, reasonable system. Um, but increasingly more and more people are kind of coming like this rebellious because the system is no longer serving them and we're seeing that even those those things that were upheld like um you know job security or the social welfare uh support is being cut back and i see what's happening at the moment in europe with the political institutions uh we in my country at the moment i still don't know if we still have a government because they've been fighting with each other while the population is suffering due to a health crisis. <laughs> so it's kind global. of like, it's a global thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you guys, you're arguing while the population is dying, who's going to vote for you if there is no population? Why aren't you not taking care of this, you know? Yeah. So it, it's, it's showing, it's kind of foregrounding how politics has become this ground for power plays. It's not really about serving the people anymore. The people are learning to serve themselves. And that's basically the whole credo of the Pluto and Aquarius era. We're going to silo ourselves into our own smaller collectives 
And we're going to have to come up with innovative ideas to govern ourselves, to create resources, you know, to hold on to what we can from the resources that are already available and to come up with creative, innovative ideas to recycle, reuse, replant, um, you know, resolarize certain areas. And I think it's an exciting time, but it will require a lot of us to just think outside of this box. And that's the uncomfortable process. That's the scary part. That's the fear that is at the moment in the collective with Saturn and Aquarius. It's like, can I do it on my own? Or can I do it just with the support of my friends and relatives and the common people around me? Not with the support of my president and, I don't know, <laughs> Trump or another wealthy magnate that can just swoop in and save the day, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's the whole, if you've noticed, like in during the Pluto and Capricorn era, there was this obsession in Hollywood with superheroes, right? Like the biggest blockbusters at the moment are all about Marvel and DC comics, right? These superheroes that swoop in and save the day. Um, but I think gradually we're gonna sweep this under the rug and understand that, you know, common folk are the superheroes, like we saw this year with delivery people and medical assistants and doctors and nurses, they're the ones that save the day eventually. And they do it over and over again, even when they end up not having the resources and not being able to take care of themselves to some point, you know? And I find that so touching. Yeah. And it kind of shows in a way how kind people continue to be and how dedicated and how hardworking they are. The majority of us are like that. But the media somehow tends to focus only on the exceptions. Mm -hmm. And that's the really annoying part. It's like you never hear, wow, Dr. Michaels in the borough around New Jersey saved 5,000 people today. Congratulations, Dr. Michaels, you know, or um, Mary, single mom in her neighborhood, organized a cupcake re rehearsal and took care of three kids, you know. It's like we don't hear these stories. And it's so sad because those are those are the real heroes, you know, those are the people that will help usher in the progress that the Pluto and Aquarius era is bringing in. Not Dr. Evil on his billion <laughs> trip, going to yeah. wherever the fuck he's going. <laughs> yes, yes, not the 1% that are partying on a yacht with Gucci bags and, you know, snorting cocaine. Yeah. Yeah, those Instagram <laughs> models to aspire to, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. But I also wanted to, before we wrap up, I wanted to do, mention, you kind of alluded to it, but you do have a, a novel. Um, I think you call it an erotic twin flame novel, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that people can yeah. read. Um, yes. I would love, yeah. actually, I would love to do a part two, um, if you feel comfortable talking about like love and twin flames and, cause you don't really talk yeah. about that, that much, do you? Well. The thing is that I'm not ashamed to talk about eroticism and sexuality. I'm kind of ashamed of the idea that I had back then that the person I was writing about is my twin flame. Mm -hmm. Because as I was doing this work and healing, I kind of realized he might have just been a player that I idealized as I was mm -hmm. healing my father wound. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of ashamed of thinking of that person. No. <laughs> but, but at least at least he inspired this, you know? And to a certain extent, the whole novel was created in such a way it's a bit messy it's a bit polyphonic it's like many different voices speaking at the same time different characters various experiences but it was created in such a way because um i was kind of connecting reconnecting with an ex as i was going through my divorce and then that situation turned out to be an illusion i was kind of like projecting a lot of my things on this ex and it turned out that he really didn't have any intentions of that way and then it was also related to a couple of um moments that I had with this guy that I thought that was my twin film so it's kind of like a variety of different experiences that made this romantic collage but to be honest I, I'm okay with speaking about love and sexuality because I think you know the thing that I'm trying to also popularize on my channel is that you need sexuality in order to have spirituality. Yeah. That's the whole point of being a fire sign or having a fire stellium. Fire signs, Aries, Leon, Sagittarius, teach us that we feel through our body. We, you know, it's that whole, when you take action, when you take a risk, 
that's when you can open up the world. That's when you can free other people. That's when you can start on this hero's journey, like Achilles did, you know, or um, the whole point is to have courage and to be bold and to feel that in our fire and act on it, you know? And yeah, I don't really see them as separate at all. I actually feel in the moments when I'm, when I'm not feeling so sexy and I'm not feeling so like, oh, good, you know, feeling myself, I actually notice that my spiritual connection tends to dwindle as well. I feel that I'm not so connected to something around me, higher up, or just that my energy is a bit like low, like a, a flame that was extinguished. And I do think that there's nothing dirty about that. It's just potentially the sadomasochistic ways in which we understand sex which come from this whole dominant submissive master slave, the man is above the woman dynamic that we've been indoctrinated into for centuries. That's when things get a bit trickier. Although, and small caveat, important caveat, I wouldn't discount that as not pleasurable mm -hmm. because we see it, how this is playing out in certain, you know, uh, BDSM communities in a very healthy and very pleasure promoting ways. But it's just more about becoming conscious of that so that when you engage in such acts, you know what you're getting yourself into. You're not just blindly going into it, looking for love and then ending up in pain, you know? Um, and there's that whole tricky terrain to navigate. Anyway, I can talk about sexuality a whole day if you want me to. So yeah, maybe it would be worth having a second one. Yeah, I think because it is from my my viewpoint is it's, it all comes from the same channel and the reason why I also resonated with your work is you speak so openly about it obviously with a safe container and I really resonate with um, you know when women can express themselves and have sexual freedom that is our freedom actually so yeah um, yeah I love your work <laughs> Oh, you do have a lot of erotic videos, which I really like. <laughs> As a double fire sign, I'm like, yes. <laughs> That's the thing is, they tend to be my most popular ones. So then when I see like, you know, 40K likes on my erotic, like uh, pick a card, I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> I, I have a messages of light one here, our career reading, and it's like 6.7K views. Okay, well, fine. I'm going to well, do more of this. Because we were in a pandemic for uh, like almost yeah. two years now, we're coming up on two years. I don't know the situation yes. in Romania. And I think, you know, it's a safe, it's the sacral chakra. It's all about creativity and passion. And I haven't felt passion or like a lust for life in a really long time. I mean, I'm single as a Pringle, but also, yeah. you know, like we're in the pandemic time. You don't know if, you know, you know, no, you don't know people's situation. <laughs> you know. <laughs> of course, of course. No, I completely understand this. And that was the whole purpose why I began doing them because I know I'm a Pisces. So I'm all about escapism. But instead of escaping in drugs or other things that can harm me, I can create the space for people to escape in a fantasy. Yeah. So it's all about creating the fantasy for them so they can daydream, so they can, maybe I can help them manifest something, you know, just make them feel good or maybe make them feel themselves more, you know, that was the whole purpose of it. And that's why I think that spirituality and sexuality are linked because it's all about getting you into the space of, fantasy imagining visioning things you know beautiful pleasurable things that you would like to see happen in your life that can help you overcome collective fear and um as freud used to call it you know the drive towards destruction mm -hmm. and death or the drive towards desire and pleasure so those are two very strong archetypes in our unconscious and you either go towards one or you go towards the other although it's never that clear I would say we tend to kind of gravitate between the two, but there is something there about fear and a mass pandemic that kind of pushes you if you want to keep thriving and surviving towards this whole, let's liberate ourselves sexually, let's think about something pleasurable. And actually, I do want to say that this is the whole um, philosophy behind the Decameron Tarot, that's a sexual theme deck. 
because it was inspired by Boccaccio's Decameron. And Giovanni Boccaccio wrote the Decameron when Europe was falling apart due to the plague pandemic. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of all of that death, he escaped by writing a text about people overcoming all sorts of taboos, you know, like the priestess was having sex with the choir boy mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> the nun was having sex with the priest and, you know, people were just like <laughs> all over each other and breaking these taboos because it's like when everything around you is dying, what can you do to affirm life? Fuck you it. have sex. <laughs> exactly. You have an orgasm and everything is better again. <laughs> In Romania, during communist times, they used to call sex the paracetamol of the poor person. Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't have money to buy a paracetamol from the pharmacy to protect your body and to build antibodies, you would just call your friend over and have sex in order to, you know, press the reset button or your immune <laughs> system. So it's just like, yeah, sex can save you sometimes, you know, it's a survival. <laughs> Yeah, and as, you were, as you were talking about that, it reminded me so much of the North Node moving into Taurus, which is like pleasure and the South Node is like, in Scorpio, like death, you know, releasing that and I think collectively, that is like, yeah. what we're going to be doing. I do hope that the North Node in Taurus is going to be more about real pragmatic commitments in love, mm -hmm. and letting go of this whole um, over fantasy bubble that we've created. Because I'm already noticing that certain people um, are kind of too much into this twin flame narrative to the point where they're putting up with really bad relationships for them that keep bringing them pain. So I hope that North Node in Taurus, because it's a sign of stability and commitment and physical pleasure, will hopefully mean that more people are going to turn towards the real, towards the body, towards the person that is in front of them physically, rather than you know the sexual fantasy that they want to escape in to heal their hearts during the pandemic. And I do think that with Jupiter and Pisces, we're going to see a loosening up of these rules and regulations that we've experienced with such cold energy, such as Capricorn and Aquarius. So fingers crossed, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a really interesting year. We'll see. <laughs> well, is there anything that I didn't ask that you wanted to oh share? God. Oh my God. No, I feel like I've been, I've overspoke. <laughs> no, I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, I've really enjoyed it, but, you know, I feel like as an introvert, I need to sleep like a week after a conversation <laughs> that was as, as like meaningful as the one that we had, you know? Mm -hmm. um, no, I've really enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much for giving me, you know, this platform. <laughs> and it's, it's nice as well to actually have somebody else ask me questions rather than to be on the giving end of mm -hmm. this kind of um, energy, I guess. So... Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm an extrovert. I'm an ENFP, I think. Um, so yeah. I like draw energy from people. So I'm really sorry um, if I'm gonna be <laughs> sleeping for a week. Sorry, everyone. But I am so grateful to you. And I'm so honored that you wanted to also that you said yes to being on this podcast because I so cherish your channel and your energy and and delivering messages in a way that's like truthful, but also with your, maybe that's your Piscean and Libra energy, like a very soft, loving tone. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, thank you so much, Lexi. <laughs> thank you too, Laura. It was such a pleasure to actually see you. <laughs>